do you sense that? When you look at the world around you and it doesn't seem quite right. You feel the struggle that exists, caught in the tension of a paradox, trying to understand the contradictions surrounding you. The paradoxical teachings of Jesus feel impossible, but upon closer inspection, will we find a deeper truth? Good morning and welcome all of those that are worshiping in Woodside right now, Minnetonka and our friends online. Glad that we can be together. And uh, to all of you, I love the energy of Time Change Sunday. Should have been here at 8.15 this morning. It was rocking. I have high expectations for this hour. It was just a great, great morning. I'm going to invite you to take out your teaching notes. You can download those online if you so choose and follow along with what I hope will be a really meaningful message for you today. We're continuing this series called Paradox and Paradoxes are uh, seemingly contradictory statements, but they're full of truth. And so, like the lowly Chicago Cubs, who now reign as World Series champs, <laughs> it's a paradox, right? It's just, like, huh? really? How can that be? You have to lean into it, but it's true. Jesus uses paradoxes all the time, and he tips up our world upside down to help us understand where real life comes from. So you have to lean into it to understand it. Last week, we were dealing with the paradox, you have to serve terrain, as the disciples were arguing over who would be the greatest among them. And then Jesus asks that powerful, compelling question, are you willing to drink the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink? I want to build on that cup of suffering with today's paradox, which is to rejoice in suffering. It's one thing to drink it, but then to rejoice in it, that's a paradox. How does that happen? And Jesus says it, but so, does all of the, or so do all of the writers in the New Testament. Each one of them, Timothy and Peter and Paul, emphasize it. Well, how can you have joy in suffering? Just take note of this right off the bat. Suffering is important. In your life, suffering is important. And joy is important. Just a first word around joy, because we define joy mostly by the world in which we live, where happiness rises when circumstances are when we want them to be, whether it is the work that we do or the relationships we have or the, the body health that we enjoy. And happiness is like a roller coaster ride. If all those things are great, we tend to do pretty well on the happiness factor, but when when circumstances fail, when they fall short, when the relationships aren't what we want them to be and the job really is far from what I had hoped for in my life, happiness tends to diminish as well. If you go to the website, happier.com, yeah, there's a website called happier.com. I went to it this week. And there's actually some pretty good stuff on there. But if you canvas the different authors like Gore and Gilbert and the Dalai Lama, you can compose the sure top five list of happiness. It's there for you. Let me give you the, the top five. Number one, be, be in possessions of the basics, like food and shelter and good health and safety. Number two, get enough sleep. Look at the difference it makes in your, own, your journey. Number three, have relationships that matter to you. Number four, be compassionate to others and to yourself. Number five, have meaningful work or something to do of interest to you. I mean, it's a good list, but... Do you realize how absurd the list is? Yes, these things can help us with happiness, but what about the people who don't have those things, which is most people of every century that has ever existed? <laughs> we don't have all of those things. Are they doomed to unhappiness? Well, yes. If we define happiness the way our culture and world looks like, because we think you have to have those things to be happy. But joy is available to them and to us. And so the joy of the Christian is not based on circumstances at all. Let's just level set that. It's based on God. And in Romans 5, Paul clarifies that suffering is part of life and that joy is the center of the Christian journey. It marks us always. It's one of the things that the world sees that compels them to consider that God is indeed real, that he is bringing salvation to all of the nations. Romans 5 speaks about the results that come to our life because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And those results um, come in various phases of maturity. We tend to grow in them. We're gonna look at those phases today. The first one is found in Romans 5, the first two verses. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And if you could circle these words, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So in the first phase of our Christian growth, we come to understand that we can have immediate joy and everyday joy because we have hope beyond death, that there is a life to follow this life, and that promise is made available to us every day we walk on the face of the earth as we have faith in Jesus Christ. It's a sure and certain hope because we have right relationship with God um, by his grace received through faith, and that makes the difference. So just hold on to this. No person can take that from you. No circumstance, however hard it might be, can rob you of that given joy. It's based on God's work, not our work. And joy flows from that reality. He won't pull it away from you. You can live and count on it all of the time. Why is that important? Because the backdrop of Paul writing those words is a similar backdrop to us. That is to say, if you believe that God is going to bless you and save you because of how good you are and how well you've lived your life, then you're not going to live with a sure, certain hope of the glory of God that is before you. Because the reality is you make it about you rather than God. And as a result of that, you deal with broken days. You're just not good every day. You don't think good thoughts all of the time. And if you do, talk with me. I really want to meet you in an interview with everybody present. And so we have these days when we're just filled with this this doubt about whether or not will we be in the presence of God. But when you understand you are saved by grace through faith, no one can take that away. So he's elevating this sure and certain hope. The initial phase of Christian growth is joy because our hope is filled with God and the life that is still before us. And not only is this true, but there's something more. Christian joy, unlike worldly happiness, is not only present when circumstances go bad, this joy Grows. What? This is the paradox, right? It's a growing joy. The joy God gives gets stronger even in bad circumstances. Verse 3 says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Wow. So we suffer. He's making it clear. And the Greek word there basically means tribulation or something that causes distress, which means it can go from a suffering that comes from everyday annoyances in your life to the extreme of major disasters that come and surprise you out of the blue and leave you stricken. And Paul says that the Christian response, Jesus says, Timothy, Peter, the Christian response to suffering is to rejoice. And some people will say, I don't buy that. I can't buy that. That makes no sense to me. That God is telling me when I'm hurting and in pain, I'm expected to rejoice in that. It's not human. It's not even natural. And of course it's not. So let's just look at what it means and what it doesn't mean. Your response to suffering doesn't mean stoicism. It doesn't mean that you grin and bear it or just tough it out kind of attitude, or don't let anything get you down, or keep a stiff upper lip. That's the old northern Scandinavian way. I will get through this. After all, we live through really harsh winters. We are a strong people, <laughs> right? And so there are some Christians who think that that's how you rejoice in suffering. But that's not it. Because there are people who don't have Christ in their life who do that. There are some people who take a great pride in how much they can deal with personal hardship and suffering. In fact, when we read rejoice in suffering, it doesn't mean rejoice for your suffering. The preposition is important. You're not expected to say that you're glad that you have hurt in your life or you have pain in your life. That's masochism. Just forget that altogether. Um, and nor is Paul saying that we're to pretend that we are happy and put a false or fake smile on because um, we're really going crazy in our hurt on the inside, but we don't want anybody to know it, so we, we kind of cover it. He's not saying that, because Christianity, friends, is never phony. I think phoniness of any kind is a false Christianity. And you think about that, because um, people can tell when we're being phony, can't they? They can smell it. And it's a genuine 
rejoicing that the scripture is telling us to embrace, that we can genuinely rejoice even in the midst of suffering. You may not be able to rejoice right at the moment of the pain, the hurt, or the trial, and God is aware of that. He understands that, and he even gives a a word related to that. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. So he's validating your pain, right? He's not saying it's not real. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and a peace for those who have been trained by it. So right at the moment, that pain, that hurt is unpleasant. He validates that. Now you still, in the midst of that, um, likely don't rejoice for the hurt, but you may rejoice that God gives hope for the future, which we just landed a short time ago, because that's with us always. I said, everybody, nobody, nobody can take that away from us. No circumstance can either take it away. And you all have probably experienced it in, in, a, in a simple little way. Have you ever been so sick in your life, or uh, you've hurt so much um, that you've just prayed to God, you've cried out to God to say, Lord, you said you were gonna come again, and right now would be a really good moment. Have you prayed that before where you've just been so sick? I know I have more than once and said, this would be a good time to return because it's so painful and you know what? Your confidence and hope in the glory of God that is in the life to come. It's gonna be a whole lot better than this life and we have these little idioms where we even express our hope. Come now, Jesus, good time in my life for you to come. But in the moment of the pain and the hurt, you may not feel like rejoicing, but you will. Another little conversation that you may have with somebody, because it's not uncommon to hear this at all. I hear it many, many times. When somebody says, I would never have chosen to go through what I went through, but I wouldn't change it for anything. Have you ever heard that? Why, would, why do we say things like that? Because we learned something. We got something when we came through it on the other side. So what does it mean to rejoice in suffering? It means you know something. And what is it that you know? Well, you know it produces something. It accomplishes something. It's productive. It has value. There's a good that will come in it. And that's what makes us rejoice, even in the midst of suffering. Think about that personally in my own life and how many times I've experienced, and it's been so many, I couldn't even count the ways, but I think of it most personally related to my kids. The fact that after our first baby, Carrie was willing to have another one is just shocking to me. <laughs> in light of what she went through, especially with our first baby, he, he got stuck in the birth canal. He had a very big head. He got caught in the birth canal. They had to press a code for emergency. Nurses, doctors came from everywhere. And really, we, we almost lost him in that given moment. They used forceps to be able to get him out to save his life. You watch a woman in labor, and if you have any empathy in you at all, you can't help but feel her pain. And yet there usually is a joy in the midst of the labor because she knows that the labor is going to produce a child. It's the child that makes it all worthwhile. That's the goal of it. And so Carrie says, okay, let's have another. I go, okay, (laughs) whatever. I got the easier part of that deal, but I'm with you. I'm cheering you on all the way, right? It's the child that makes it all worthwhile and makes it able for her to go through it again. Suffering produces something worthwhile. Well, Paul says in our text today that there are four worthwhile things that suffering produces that helps us to rejoice. I want to touch on each of them briefly. First of all, you know that suffering produces perseverance, or could I put a twist on it? It produces steadiness. The Greek word here means to stay under the pressure. Think about that. Pressure is usually something we want to get away from, to get out from being under How can I get through this as fast as I can? But suffering teaches us to stay under the pressure, to stick in there, to hang in there, not just to survive, but to prevail. And it's Christ that changes that worldview. Get away from the survival mindset. We are not called to survive. We are called to prevail, and he gives the strength for us to do that. Perseverance is the opposite of panic or trying to bail out and get out from under the pressure right away. So a good English translation is the word steadiness. Suffering produces steadiness. What a worthwhile quality. 
Carrie's mom and dad um, have a hobby farm. Carrie grew up in that home, and they've had horses um, all of their years, dozens and dozens and dozens of horses. And uh, it's been a beautiful place to go and to see the horses in the field and all of that. He's broken in hundreds of horses. So I called him and I asked him, how do horses respond the first time that you place a saddle on a horse? And he took that in because it's, it's something I would, I would never do. I mean, my exposure to horses is very limited. At 17, I dated a girl who was a, a phenomenal horse rider. And she said, when I asked her on a date, do you want to come to our place and ride a horse? I go, I've never done that. Yeah, let's do it. We do it. And the, the horse takes off on a full gallop. And she can't control it. I'm by myself on the horse. I was scared to death. I haven't ridden a horse since. And I never asked her out on a second date. It ended everything, <laughs> right? That it was just over with. So I love horse people, and I watch Carrie's dad, and I'm taken by just the giftedness, the horse whisperer qualities that you find in people who love horses. And he says, when you put that saddle on the first time, a horse that's never had a saddle, they have a response. He says, you have to know, Joel, that there's a deep trust between a horse and its owner, and it grows over time. But when you put the saddle on the horse for the first time, even though that horse knows you really well, the horse will not like it. And in fact, sometimes they panic, sometimes they kick, and sometimes they even get ornery and really hard to handle when before they would be easy to handle because they, they wonder what you're doing by putting this heavy thing on them. It's uncomfortable, it's an unknown territory. They have to learn to trust you. I said, well, how do they learn to trust you? He says, you, you talk to them. And I can picture him doing this, you know. You talk to the horse. It's going to be okay. It, it, all is going to be well. You calm the horse down with your voice and your hand. Now, I've been with him when uh, horses are unpleasant. And how he speaks, I mean, his voice is so calming. Honestly, I could get in the fetal position and go to sleep right there in the field. <laughs> I'm as comforted as, he, as the horse is getting comforted. And the horse just settles down. Eventually, they trust they steady themselves. And they allow that pressure of the saddle to continue to be on them. Do you remember the first time as a Christian you went through a hard trial and how easily you just panicked in your spirit and you cried out to God, what are you doing? And where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen to me? And you hate it because it makes you feel like everything that you value in life is getting messed up. Your hopes and your dreams may be at risk because of the suffering you're going through. See, we're just like the disciples in the boat of the Sea of Galilee when that storm comes raging in. Do you remember they panicked in that moment? And they cried out to Jesus who was sleeping while they're panicking and they say, wake up, wake up. Don't you realize we're about to die? Pay attention, Jesus. And the Lord did with them as he does with us. He stood up. And he said, don't panic. And then he talked to the storm, and he said to the storm, be still. And quiet came. Quiet came. That's what suffering does. It steadies you. You go through a time like that, and you get panicky in the beginning, and the Lord calms the storm. And you say to yourself, thank you, God, and thank God that it's all over with. And then three weeks later, there's another storm. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Out of the blue, and there she is. But this time, you've gone through it once, so you steady up a bit. You don't get quite so panicky because you learn something. You learn something about yourself first. You learn that you're not as strong as you thought you were. You learn that your inclination is to bail out faster than ever you thought you would, but you don't know until you get into the midst of that kind of heavy weight upon you. And then you learn something about the Lord. You learn how gracious he is and how merciful he is in your place of need. And you see him begin to work things out that you could have never dreamed or scripted on your own if you even tried. And so the third and the fourth time the trial comes upon you, you're steadier. You don't panic so much. You understand this is part of life. You don't try to bail out so quickly. You stay under and let it work itself out. That's what Paul is saying, that suffering produces steadiness. And if you didn't suffer, friends, you wouldn't have that quality. And if you're a parent, your children will learn that quality from you more than anybody else. Your colleagues will learn what it means to be steady as you go through hardship, how you handle the difficulty in that environment. 
And not only does suffering produce this worthwhile quality of steadiness, number two, you know that suffering produces character and reliability. Uh, the word here for character carries with it the idea of being put to the test and approved. Uh, the idea is to be shown to be reliable. I like the twist of this little phrase, to be reliable. Steadiness produces reliability. You start to learn that what you're going through isn't going to destroy you, that all things are going to work out in one way or another. It may not be the way you envisioned it, but God has something in mind that will be good, that will be evidenced as you work it through. Steady up, and something happens. People start to come to you. They see your character in strength, and you become to them a more reliable person. And something happens to you. You become more reliable to yourself. You start to think, oh, I will get through this. I've gone through something like this before. Let me illustrate this a little bit. I don't own a Jeep. For all of you Jeep people out there, that's a cool, cool vehicle to own. I don't own one, but I love their commercials. In fact, when I go to the car show, uh, I always, with a buddy of mine, we always go to the Jeep cars because you can ride the obstacle course at the car show. Did you know that? It's in March. You can join me there if you like. It's, it's really fun. But I love their commercials because the Jeep is put through these horrendous tests. They're driven through desert sands and bogs and swamps and marshes and pothole roads and, and rocky mountains. And they're, they're driving over studded boards with nails. Well, okay, I added the last one, but I just feel like I watched the commercial. It can do anything, can it? That's what you feel like. After the test is over, then they come up onto the screen in the commercial and say, we proved our capability. The Jeep has earned its badge. Buy a Jeep. They're tested and approved. They want you to believe that. And God does do that. Not for the Jeep so much, but for you, he does. That's what character means. God is building you up so he can hold you up and say, she's approved, she's tested, she's reliable. And as character is strengthened, you start to notice that people are drawn to you. They seek you out for wisdom because they think to themselves, how did you go through everything you went through and still have joy? It stands up, it stands out. People are drawn into that arena. It's a worthwhile quality. You know suffering produces steadiness and steadiness reliability. And third, you know that suffering produces hope or certainty. So now that we're back into hope again in verse two, remember Paul spoke of rejoicing in the hope of sharing the glory of God, the hope about the future that happens beyond death, the life that follows this life. But here is hope that we share the glory of God, which is God's character right now. This day, we have this beautiful promise that God is producing the image of Christ in us right now. What a great thing. And this hope is a certainty. It's not just a possibility that we are maturing in the ways of Christ. We are becoming like him when we abide in him and obey him and are devoted to his purposes and his will and his way. We're being changed and we can see it. We can feel it in our own life. We're becoming more like Jesus, more thoughtful, more compassionate, more peaceful, more loving. We're becoming like Christ, stronger and wiser and pure, all pure. Because the appetites that I had before Christ um, aren't satisfying in the same way that I had thought they would be. I'm always left feeling empty. But the promises of the Lord and the, the character qualities that lead us to that which is noble and right and good and pure just enrich our soul. And we long for it. We go after it. That's the promise. And to our amazement, a certainty grows in our hearts that God is doing this work just as he said he would, Philippians 1, 6. I'm not ashamed. Or, um, I, he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. He started this work, this confidence, oh, that I have eternal life. What a great thing. That's the beginning of Christian maturity, but then it unpacks from there. And he deepens our life so we become more like Christ. He started a work. He's going to complete that work. There's one more quality. You know that hope does not put us to shame. Or can I put a twist or disappoint us. I love the words of Romans 1.16, probably my theme verse in life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for all salvation. I'm not ashamed. It means, this word shame, that I'm not afraid. I, I am proud. 
I'm confident, I'm bold, that hope or certainty produces within us this confidence and this boldness, it will not disappoint. I will stand up with God and for Christ because it builds a confidence in me. And so God uses the hard stuff to get our attention, to demonstrate his strength to get us through it, to make us more ready and bold and confident for life. It's a worthwhile quality. I think we could use a higher dose of confidence throughout our whole society. And God would give that as we trust in him through faith in Christ. And so we lose our fear and ridicule or shame of saying, hey, I'm a Christ follower and I know everything good in life comes from him. Not from the work of these hands, but from him. And we share our experiences and we speak about what God has brought us through so very much. And then Paul goes on to explain and wrap up this little section why our hope does not disappoint us. He says again, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It is the explanation above all else why we rejoice in suffering. Before we were saved, God proved his love by sending Christ to die for us. And wouldn't you agree that it is an amazing, amazing love? What a love it is because we find that his love, if his love offers up to us his son, and that love helps him not only come into the messiness of our world, but to suffer on our behalf, to die for our sin. And that love not only helps him endure all of that, but raises him up. Then we now who are his children have that promise of his same love that's in us because the Holy Spirit has poured it out in us. And when we connect those dots at the very same love that had the power to bring Jesus, to allow him to suffer and die and rise up as we come by faith to receive that grace, have the Holy Spirit pour into us this incredible love that will help us endure the hardship of life. If it was true in his coming, it's true in our living and abiding in him today. The love of God is poured out into our hearts and I love that little word, pour out. It's a way of expressing experience. So we rejoice for the hope of the glory of God, the life that is still to come after this life, but we get the hors d'oeuvre before the feast. We love hors d'oeuvres. Do you guys love hors d'oeuvres? Somehow, I don't know, it makes the feast even better. We anticipate the feast as we partake of the hors d'oeuvre, and that's exactly what we're being reminded here. It's the heart of Christianity and the heart of Christian joy the foretaste of glory to come is the taste of his love in the here and now. And unless you have this joy, you will rely on worldly happiness based on favorable circumstances, which you know are fragile, and your life is a roller coaster ride. But his joy is in us as we receive Christ to have hope for tomorrow and the life still to come and a foretaste of that glory as we live for him now. And that's why we come to the table, to eat, to drink, to be reminded of his coming, his dying and suffering, and his rising, that we would have life and love today in anticipation of the life still to come. So let's come to the table in prayer. Father, we're mindful of what has been accomplished on our behalf through your generosity, the giving to us of Jesus Christ. And for us who have had a foretaste, we know as we come to this table, just quicken our hearts, especially if we're in a suffering kind of place that you have eyes to see and you provide for us in it. But Lord, my heart all morning has been mindful of those who have not yet yielded, surrendered, given their life to you, believed that you are Son of God, Savior of our soul. I pray that your word would be manifest and before the bread and the cup hits their hearts, that they would quietly in the confession of their own soul say, Lord Jesus, I believe and I receive. May we fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorned its shame, and now sits at your right hand. He pours out in us love that produces steadiness, reliability, certainty that does not disappoint. That's what we look for, that joy that comes from your love, and we honor you as we remember you.